Yeah, it checks if everything works and start. How many? Uh, okay. Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, people are joining. Yeah, so they don't need seats, so it actually goes a little bit slower <laughs> than the phys physical room. Okay. Uh, first of all, I would like to pay my respects to the traditional custodians of the land on which we are all working from today. I also would like to acknowledge the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders people participating in this seminar. Okay, uh, hello uh, everyone. Today we have the seven talks of the colloquium. Uh, today I'm happy to present Tammy uh, Peric Bernier, who is a professor at the McGill University in Canada. She is one of the experts in the topological matter, including topological superconductivity, magnetism, and Flaque systems. Uh, Tammy has made PhD in 2005 in the University of British Columbia, and after postdoctoral positions in the University of Texas at Caltech, she has moved to the McGill, where she is professor now. And during her career, time has received a number of different fellowships and awards. Uh, so, okay, uh, time, please feel free to start. And we will okay. enjoy the talk. Okay. Thank you so much, Dimitri, for organizing this. Uh, I will try to start the presentation. Let me know if you see the correct screen of the presentation. No, okay. Do you see the, the slides? Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Okay, great. So thank you so much. Uh, I know uh, some of you are in the middle of breakfast. Some of you uh, might be in the middle of dinner. Um, I'm definitely hungry. So right after <laughs> I'm gonna go. Uh, thank you for being with me, even though I know all of us are kind of sick of Zoom uh, by now, but we make the most of it. And I think, uh, one of the advantages is that we got used to visiting different places uh, remotely very easily. So uh, thanks for being here and let me just start. So today I want to talk about uh, domain wall and skirmion bound states on the surface of uh, magnetic topological insulators. And what I mean by that is that I have uh, surface states which are two-dimensional Dirac cone-like uh, states that are uh, coupled to magnetic moments, which uh, are also on the surface. And all of this talk is about the interplay between these uh, two kinds of degrees of freedom. So what I'm gonna talk about is first, what is a magnetic topological insulator very briefly, um, and then talk about surface uh, ferromagnetism, domains uh, and skirmions, and then how to probe uh, a surface of a magnetic topological insulator. I'm going to talk about uh, bound states of domain walls and skirmions and their bound states, uh, the interaction between skirmions and how it's mediated by Dirac electrons. And, and then uh, finally talk about what do Dirac fermions do when you put them in contact with a skirmion solid. So that might sound like a lot, but actually there are only two players there are uh, electrons and spins. And it's all in 2D. Actually, I spend most of my life uh, in two dimensions where all of the fun happens. Uh, and if I don't get to the end of the talk, it's always important for me uh, to acknowledge my collaborators. Actually, I hope that uh, you can see my laser pointer. Uh, so Kunal Tiwari and Juliette Lavoie are former students. Kunal did most of the work of the first part of the talk and he was co-supervised between me and Bill Koish, my colleague here at McGill. And the last part of the talk about skirmion solids is with my friends, Arun Paramikantri, Paramikantri from uh, Toronto University, Henry Ling and Stefan Divik. Stefan is now, uh, used to be a student in Toronto and now uh, is at Berkeley. 
So let me just get straight to the point. Um, what's a symmetry protected topological insulator? Um, you can think of a topological insulator as an insulator that is not, um, you can't deform a trivial insulator into a topological insulator without closing the gap. That's the, the meaning of topology in this context. Um, and uh, if something is symmetry protected, actually, as you tune parameters to go from an insulator and you try to make a topological insulator, you have to maintain the symmetry. So it could be that if you didn't maintain the symmetry, these two states were connected, but if you maintain the symmetry, they are distinct, and therefore one is topological, uh, the other is not. Uh, but more physically, we have the bound boundary correspondence, which means that if you have um, a surface of a topological insulator or an edge of a 2D topological insulator, you'll get boundary states that are ungapped because the gap has to close as you go from topological to either the vacuum or a non-topological insulator. So an example here in two-dimensional um, space, if we have time reversal um, invariant system, which is a topological insulator, we expect edge modes, which are uh, chiral uh, with opposite spins uh, going in opposite directions. This is the quantum spin Hall effect. Uh, in three dimensions, um, the bulk here in the uh, spectrum, the bulk states are in blue. Uh, the bulk is gapped, but within the gap, you can see uh, these Dirac-like uh, states. And uh, if you're familiar with the Dirac uh, systems, you know that in a purely two-dimensional um, system, you shouldn't expect to just see an odd number of Dirac cones, they always come in pairs, but in a 3D topological insulator, you can have two surfaces and one Dirac cone on each. So we avoid the doubling theorem by uh, going into a surface. And that also tells you that there's no standalone theory for the surface of a topological insulator. Maybe an effective theory, but it's not complete unless you have two surfaces. Um, magnetic topological insulator. So now I'm thinking of a topological insulator in 3D that has surface states in 2D. So on the left, I see a non-gapped uh, Dirac fermion. I wrote uh, a Hamiltonian for that, an effective Hamiltonian, which looks like basically momentum K dot sigma, where sigma are Pauli matrices in some uh, space, uh, two-dimensional space, which could be a pseudo spin space or a spin space. Now, if I have, uh, if I add magnetic moments on the surface, so I should say in a magnetic topological insulators, you have uh, magnetism everywhere or you have moments everywhere. In the bulk, you don't care, the bulk uh, electronic states are already gapped. Uh, but now on the surface, they actually break time reversal symmetry, especially if they're ordered in a ferromagnetic uh, order. So I drew them like that. And that for the purpose of Dirac electrons, they actually look like a mass. Um, and this mass opens a gap, we call it the Dirac mass, opens a gap uh, in your bulk spectrum. However, so, okay, that mass uh, just basically ruins your, your surface states. However, if now the mass changes sign, and now I just drew um, arrows here to denote that the mass changes sign because the spins may be flipping from the left to the right, then uh, your um, coupling to the magnetization actually is a function of uh, space. And here we took a simple profile where it just changes along one line. And what you would expect is what we call a jakiv rebi state on that line. So even though you have a gap on both sides, you would actually get the propagating state uh, at zero energy, which actually uh, is linearly dispersion, dispersing with momentum along the edge and is exponentially decaying away from the edge. And here we put this uh, exponential decay is actually proportional to the mass that you have in the bulk. 
So these are Jakiv Rebbe states and they are bound to domain walls. Um, we also can see uh, something very similar if we just take a topological insulator on one side and a trivial insulator on the other side. Um, it, in terms of the low energy physics, there's always going to be one Dirac cone that changes the sign of its mass from the left to the right. Um, and we're after these states. Um, so what got me first to be interested uh, in this particular problem came a long time ago from some experimentalists, and I'll show the, the experiments that really got me into this, uh, that talked about uh, samarium hexaboride. So this has been known as a condo insulator for a long time, uh, but only a few years ago, it was um, um, considered as a, as a topological insulator. And I think we have good indication now that this is actually a strong topological insulator. And it has both strong interactions magnetic moments and uh, topological behaviors. And it turns out that on uh, the surface of this topological insulator, you have a three, uh, three Dirac cones. Uh, two of them are degenerate and the Fermi energy is not at the Dirac point, but one of them is actually at the Dirac point. So we have some Fermi surfaces from these uh, Dirac uh, cones that are not at uh, zero energy. And we have um, an another cone in which our Fermi surface is at the zero. And it, it turns out that there are also um, um, these uh, states on the surface, uh, these magnetic moments on the surface that really do arrange ferromagnetically and uh, give us a little gap for uh, the magnetic moment, for the Dirac electrons. Um, and here are some measurements. Uh, you see the condo uh, signature, which is an upturn in the susceptibility at low temperatures. Um, if you look at more recent uh, work that people did, the DFT and so on, they actually find uh, these uh, states that are within the gap and they're suspected to be uh, topological surface states. Um, and now the, the thing that intrigued me is, was that I, I met with uh, John pierre uh, Paglioni from um, Maryland, and he told me about uh, these magnetoresistance measurements that he's, do, he's been doing on uh, um, this suspected topological condo insulator samarium hexaboride. And he sees this kind of hysteresis. So we are all used to seeing hysteresis in ferromagnetism in uh, the magnetization. And we're gonna talk about uh, the relation between these two, but if you think of why do you have even a hysteresis? Why does the magnetism care whether you go up in field or down in field? It's basically about creating domains. When you flip, let's say all the spins are up, when you flip the field, you don't instantly flip all the spins there's some energy cost to flipping spins. Uh, so you nucleate some domains. Here, on the other hand, we're calculating, uh, we're measuring not the spins, not the magnetization, we're measuring the resistivity of the electrons. And it turns out to be hysteretic. And this is called a butterfly hysteresis because it's kind of uh, symmetric around zero um, uh, magnetic field. We'll talk a little bit about why, uh, how we think we understand that. In the original paper, they had this idea of a checkerboard-like uh, ferromagnetic. Um, so each of these uh, little squares is a little ferromagnetic island. And they thought of a, um, a checkerboard pattern. It turns out it doesn't have to be a checkerboard. But the idea was that what gives rise to the hysteresis is uh, the states that are connecting uh, domain walls. So if you have a domain wall that you can uh, draw a line that goes from one side of your sample to the other, or more importantly, from one electrode, electrode to the other, you can measure some current uh, that's associated with these domain wall bound states. Uh, there were other measurements, maybe I won't go into it, some other candidates for uh, this condo topological insulator or a magnetic topological insulator. 
uh, they also see sometimes hysteresis in sigma xy. So sigma xy, um, the Hall conductivity is very um, related to edge modes or maybe one dimensional modes because it's quantized, uh, you know, in the quantum uh, limit of that, it's quantized. And here it's also believed to have to do with domain wall bound states. So what we set out to do, and this is another, um, you know, heuristic picture from uh, the paper. What we set out to do is try to understand how uh, the measurement of magneto transport is influenced by the domains and try to make a connection between the domains and the conductivity or resistivity that you uh, measure. So what we try to do is think of something uh, much simpler. So let's say I have source and drain. This is my surface. I have all of these spins. I'm not drawing all of them. And maybe I flip some of the spins such that I have a down domain and up domain and then down domains again. Then in between, I have domain walls. And on them, uh, if I have Dirac electrons, I can think of the Dirac electrons as having a mass that changes sign in space. Therefore, I expect jakiv rebi states um, along the domain walls. And if I look here, this is exactly the same picture I showed before. So I expect around the domain walls, even though it's not the same symmetries, to have these uh, states within the gap. So to simplify um, our thinking, we wanted to do something like that. I have domain walls. Uh, they are circulating because we saw that they're actually chiral. They have a preferred direction, which depends on the sign of the mass inside or outside the domain. Um, but I want to look at something much more simple, which is a very narrow junction in which I can think of every domain as a single spin, which I just flip up or down. And whenever I flip a spin, uh, I create a new domain or I annihilate the domain and a domain wall forms. And now if I measure source to drain conductance, of course, in samarium hexaboride, I have also bulk, uh, 2D bulk conductivity from these Dirac cones that are not centered at zero energy but I should also have, in addition, these domain wall bound states. Uh, and I should see them as a signature in my uh, drain source uh, conductivity. In the experiment, uh, it looks like they see at most one domain wall. So maybe the source and drain are also very small. Uh, but in principle, you can see more than that. Um, one complication here is that we also ex expect edge modes on top and bottom of the sample. So to avoid that, we thought of a Corbino geometry just for the, the sake of, uh, of calculations. So in our Corbino geometry, we basically think of single spins representing the domains. They interact with the Ising um, Hamiltonian. This uh, is here. Basically, there's some cost to uh, deviating from uh, the spins being aligned with each other. And there's also an external field, which we change in order to see, um, to, to change things and start flipping the spins. So what do we expect to happen based on our very simple analysis? So assume that we start with all spins down. If I measure the conductivity coming uh, from uh, domain wall bound states, I have no domain walls, conductivity should be zero. If I measure the magnetization, we are fully magnetized in the minus direction because all spins are down. So this is why I see minus one in terms of my magnetization. And this is for positive field. So I increase the field. Of course, if all I had was the Zeeman coupling to the Zeeman field and no, no uh, cost for flipping, all of the spins should be actually up. But that's not the case because every time I flip a spin, I will create domain walls. So uh, what happens is that only if I apply enough field such that it's energetically favorable to flip a spin and create two domain walls, then uh, the flip would happen. It happens here, let's say. 
Uh, so here I flipped one domain or one spin and my magnetization uh, became uh, higher in, in uh, positive value. And immediately my conductivity from source to drain, which here is from inside to outside, jumped to one unit of conduction. This is E squared over H. Why? Because I have one channel, one, uh, one dimensional channel. Now, if I increase the magnetic field, we assume that it's favorable for the domain to grow. We don't nucleate more domains because we assume it's actually energetically more favorable to grow the domain rather than add, um, add another domain. So um, I see that there is a question. I will uh, pause for questions in a little while. Um, so, so now if I keep uh, increasing the field, I would actually um, flip more and more spins, the conductivity uh, will stay the same because the number of domain walls didn't change, but the magnetization is creeping up until I totally saturate. When I totally saturate uh, the conductivity, actually the, the two domain walls collapse and I, I, there's no domain wall anymore because there's only one domain for the whole system. So if you remember this, um, this rise in conductivity, let me try to annotate, I don't know if I can. Rise in conductivity that reminds you one side of the hysteresis curve, uh, this is what you usually get. It takes time to increase the magnetization and in our case, the conductivity just goes up and falls down. Once the um, magnetization doesn't change anymore, it falls back down. So if I draw it in two of the directions, and this is just one run that I do uh, for randomly flipping the spins, there's a, um, you see the usual hysteresis curve. And every time the magnetization changes, um, I have a conductivity of one for a small period of time. Now you might remember that our data didn't look exactly the same. So instead of plotting uh, the resistivity, we now plot the conductivity, but we have some background which is coming from 2D conductivity. So if we just take, and this is the experimentalist did that, take uh, the up field versus down field, conductivity and take the difference between them, um, then you should see only the things that come from these domain wall states, not the things that come from uh, these um, Fermi surfaces. And indeed, what they see uh, is basically a curve that looks like that. It doesn't look exactly like my da data yet. So let me um, do a little bit more. Um, Maybe I'll skip ahead a little bit because I see that I'm not going very fast. But what we did is some sort of a master equation calculation in which we uh, calculate the probability to flip spin and the probability to grow a domain. Um, and we, we solve for that and we could have done some statistics that uh, if we average over uh, statistical data, um, our curves look kind of like this, and we can even uh, give some estimates to what uh, the width of uh, this peak should be and what the height of the peak should be. Uh, and that looks a bit more like the data that we saw for uh, the hysteresis uh, kind of uh, part of the conductivity. Uh, so going from this, basically averaging that over uh, different realizations, uh, we get this. So maybe this is a good place uh, to stop before I go on and ask if people have questions. Uh, maybe- Questions of, co of course, Alex. Uh, <laughs> um, sorry, so I'm just switching between devices. Um, so I, I had one question, which is this butterfly hysteresis, um, you can see quite often in, not, in completely non-magnetic sy systems. Right, right. It's, it's not the only thing that gives you butterfly hysteresis. Uh, we tried to look at other causes here. I don't remember all of them. 
uh, we looked at um, you know parametric cooling and other things. This seems to be um, plausible for for our system. Um, one thing though is um, I think there aren't many experiments yet, but the height of this peak, this G star, can never go beyond E squared over H. And this is something we see in the data, or I shouldn't say that. Uh, if you create one domain wall, it couldn't go beyond E squared over H. So that's something I don't think you necessarily see in other butterfly hysteresis um, experiments. Does that uh, answer your question? I, so the, the place I yeah, sorry, the place I've checked, so a magnetothermal effect, that you get an adiabatic demagnetization of, uh, from the cryostat or, or from any wiring. If there's anything, if there's any magnetic moments in your leads or the solder that you've used, which is quite common, like because solder is superconducting, um, you get a, a sudden adiabatic demagnetization, which warms the sample when you're sweeping toward, when you're demagnetizing. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, it warms the sample when you're magnetizing. And so it's very sweep rate dependent because obviously it's, it goes as B dot squared. Right, and, right. And so that's why I was asking you, is there a sweep rate dependence on this hysteresis, you know, the, the, the size of the hysteresis, the, the size of the resistance change? Yeah, because so in I, I don't have that data. Um, I don't know. We, we had some discussions with the experimentalist, but I don't think uh, that they have that. Uh, they didn't provide us with that, but you're right that we could do more to, to actually distinguish this mechanism from others. And that's why we made some predictions that uh, one can verify. For example, this V here is the sweep uh, speed. So one mm -hmm. can also see things um, versus sweep speed. Um, so yeah, I think you're, you're totally right to, to point out stuff like that. Okay. So, uh, I also Thanks. have a question. Could, could, could you show this uh, hysteresis picture again? You mean the experimental? Uh, yeah, for, experimental. yeah, from the experimental data. Yes, let's now find it here. I think is even the first one. It has, ah, it has okay. some sharp features that very small magnetic fields, ah, some abrupt transition. Uh, just a second. Yeah, I mean, there. Uh, it's true. There are many features there. Here, yeah. There's something happening in very, very low magnetic uh, field. This one, this yes. small steps. Are they? Uh, is it as understood what happens? No, there? no. And and our theory also doesn't uh, account for that. We don't really know what it is. Um, so I can't tell you, we had some ideas, but uh, uh, you yes. know, I'm not ready to, to gamble on them. So for, for one dimensional model, there is this uh, steps that conducted quanta, but how large the steps? Are no, this is a small step. This might be uh, close to one quantum of conductance at the maximum. Mm -hmm. uh, but only at very low temperatures. If you have higher temperatures, it looks uh, smaller. Uh, okay, Th thank you. We have uh, also other questions. Uh, Augustin, please go ahead. Yes, hi, uh, I'm Dimitri and okay. Sami. Uh, uh, my next question, where, where does the condo physics uh, play a role here, if any? So, so the condo physics uh, plays a role in making this an insulator to begin with. Uh, it's mostly in the bulk. What we have on the surface is kind of a, a leftover because it's a topological insulator, which also, you know, here people would argue whether it comes from the interactions or not. I'm not worried about this at this point, but there's a, a big debate going on whether this is really a condo or a correlated topological insulator, and you can say, ah, oh, it's actually not uh, not a band topological insulator. It's a condo topological insulator. Um, I care about the surface, and on the surface, you just have these uh, leftover Dirac cone and leftover topological um, magnetic moments. Okay, thank you. 
Uh, we also have a question from uh, Abai. Please go ahead. Um, yeah, so it's an interesting topic. Um, how narrow channel, channel lens are we talking about? Um, that's a good question. I mean, the, the channel, the experimental channel is not very narrow. I don't know how long, uh, how long it is. I'm sure it's written somewhere here, but um, for us to see, we don't necessarily need a narrow channel. It just makes uh, the picture simpler to analyze. If you have a large uh, channel, which is not narrow, I should expect that domain walls will not necessarily be straight. So it's just a matter of making uh, the domain walls uh, straight. And that's a complicated question to ask. What are really the, the limits on how narrow the channel should be to make that happen. So it's yeah. not it's not a well-defined, uh, I don't have a good answer for that. Okay, and I have a second question. So uh, why does this spin flip occurs in a clockwise or anti-clockwise direction in the Corbino symmetry? So can't we have one slip, uh, spl uh, spin flip uh, like, and the second one on the op uh, like diagonally or diametrically opposite direction so that you get two channels? Yeah, so, so the two channels you have, if you have a topological insulator um, with, or yeah, let's say a 2D topological insulator and a normal insulator. One way to look at a 2D topological insulator would be to say, I have actually two uh, valleys or two massive Dirac cones with a mass that changes sign in momentum space between the two valleys. And then, on the other side, you, you would have two Dirac cones and the mass is the same for both. And that would be your trivial insulator. In that case, um, because you have two Dirac cones on the other side, I can say, let's say, oh, sorry, I didn't, yeah. Let's say this is only negative. Then this part doesn't contribute um, at all uh, a surface state, but this cone that changes sign between the two sides does contribute a surface state. Um, so, so in that sense, it's similar to that situation. But if you have uh, if you have vacuum on the other side, you should just expect to see uh, uh, two modes with opposite spins. Yes. But it's not, so, it's not what we have now because we um, we we kind of gapped. Uh, there's no spin anymore in the problem. We kind of um, sorry. There's there's only one Dirac cone in the problem. We don't have the two Dirac cones anymore. Okay, uh, but my question was related to like if you go to the nucleation and the spin flipping picture one. So, yes. Um, you think about this one or, or what? Uh, like the ones in the Corbino symmetry, for example. Okay, yes. So when you're flipping the spin, so why the spin, uh, spin flip has to occur like uh, one uh, spin flipping and the next one too is uh, also spin flipping. So can't we have uh, like one and five, then five, not two changing the uh, sign of like, Inside. So, so I, I'm not sure I understand, but every time you create a domain, you do create these two modes, but yes. they're, they're chiral. You can think about that, you know, it's kind of like uh, the chiral modes of a quantum Hall effect. So if yeah. I measure conductivity, I, I put chemical potential difference either going up or down, right, between the source and drain. So I can only see one of these modes, I don't see Yeah, that. I do understand that, but I'm just asking like in between channel e, uh, one and eight, uh, so the spin is in up direction, that's all our spin down. Suppose then instead of uh, changing the spin uh, in between one and two next, right? I yeah, change the spin the of, yeah, instead of that, I change the spin of between five and four. Yes, okay, so when you do that, uh, what you would actually do is you nucleate another domain wall. Yes, um, so I'm, I'm just we have assuming, two channels. 
yeah, then you will have more channels and definitely you can see it in the transport. What we're assuming here is that the nucleation happens when it happens with some magnetic field when you have enough. But as I increase the magnetic field, the growth of the domain wall is much faster than nucleating another one. It's an assumption okay. and that has to do with um, orders of magnitude of the domain wall energy versus uh, the flip uh, energy or I should say the, the Zeeman energy. Yeah. So it's okay. a, a simplifying assumption. And you know that's a great question to, to bring me to this slide, which is basically saying, if you wanted to do a more detailed measurement and just see these uh, states, you can uh, do one source and many different drains. And if you do that, yeah. you would see them light up at different times. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Let's continue. Okay, so I'll move on. Uh, so as I said, this is just our proposal to kind of do a spatially resolved uh, conductivity. I, I won't go into the details of this, but basically you should see current from source to drain uh, changing its position along uh, the, the Corbino and uh, the other one going in the opposite direction as your domain is growing. Um, Okay, but now I want to change gears and talk about an anisotropic ferromagnet. So, so far, I just thought of icing spins. Uh, maybe we have last questions okay. on, this, on, on this topic. Okay, sure. Uh, Alex, please go ahead. So, so th thanks for answering all these questions. It's, it's very interesting. Um, so, is it possible to, uh, in, in that geometry you were suggesting, um, probably the is it possible to sort of do like the racetrack memory thing and try and push the domain wall? Uh, is, is there any motive force you can apply to move a domain wall and see it, and ideally see it jump past two of those leads, right? So you'd suddenly see a, a decrease in conductance in one and an increase in conductance in the other. So you can actually watch the domain wall moving. Yes, so that's an, an excellent question. So I think one simple thing to do is just to change the magnetic field. If you can magnetize your sample and then apply a field in the opposite direction, you will nucleate domain, domains and they will change their size. How exactly that really depends on you know, energetics. Um, you might uh, wanna do a bit more and, and try to locally control the magnetic field and, and force the domain to happen. But I don't know, this I think is very, very difficult to do. Shall we go on? Thanks, yeah. Okay, great, thank you. Um, it's much thank better you. when people ask questions, even if I don't get to the end, it's, it's fine. So, okay, so new system that I want to think about now. Again, I have Dirac electrons and I have a magnet. Um, but now I added more terms. So, so this J, you should think of it as like a Heisenberg term. I wrote that here in terms of the magnetization, but you can think of that as like a penalty for changing the magnetization too quickly. So it just wants uh, nearby spins to be aligned. The aloshinsky moria uh, term often comes from some remnants of spin orbit coupling and uh, Basically, it wants to create um, vortices in uh, the magnetization. And um, Zeeman energy is the same as what we had before. And you can also have instead or, or in addition, some uh, easy access and isotropy. And this is a generic form of a Hamiltonian that you can write uh, for your magnet. And here we're thinking of 2D. And it turns out that because you have this D field, not simple domain walls happen. Now we're allowing the spins to, to be in all directions, uh, but instead um, you see skirmions. Uh, and this actually, uh, for this part of the work, uh, some of uh, the work coming from a group that uh, Dimitri was a part of uh, in Maryland was very inspiring for us. So, so first of all, let me talk about a skirmion for a second. The skirmion is a, is a texture of a spin that could sometimes minimize this energy. 
uh, with all of these complex terms that actually prefer different things, right? Uh, the J doesn't want things to change in space. D actually does want uh, things to change in space. And the two last terms want things to be aligned with the Z direction. So this competition might lead to a skirmion, uh, which basically uh, is a defect in your ferromagnet. Uh, the spins, let's say, are up in the middle. Uh, sorry, they're down in the middle. They're up uh, uh, outside, far from the skirmion. And on the perimeter of, of the skirmion, they wind in some way. Um, if you cut through that, you would see that there's a, a, a radius that you can measure. And there's this psi, which is kind of like a healing length of how fast you go from one configuration to another of spin. So this is the Z magnetization, which is here, the color. So uh, there are different skirmions. Uh, here I highlight two types, which is block and male. You can think of it this way. Uh, the magnetization is a vector which changes both as a function of the radius from the middle of the skirmion out and as a function of um, the angle. As a function of the angle, there's just winding of the in-plane magnetization with winding number W. We take here W to be one. Uh, and an offset phi naught, which for block skirmion is pi over two, for nail skirmion is zero. And there's a profile that is only dependent on the radius, which tells you what the Z magnetization is doing. So this function theta of R basically goes from minus uh, one to one, or sorry, from minus pi to pi, uh, to give you, um, oh, sorry, from zero to pi to give you that texture. And skirmions are topological defects. You can define this topological number. In our case, it would be equal to this W. So this is a property of the ferro -magnetic, magnetic system. And we again ask the question, what will happen to Dirac fermions if they are coupled uh, to this uh, type of skirmion uh, via Zeeman kind of coupling? So I think of each one of these uh, magnetic moments as just giving me a, a local Zeeman field in the direction of uh, the moment. Um, so, this is our Hamiltonian. We have a Dirac, sorry for the, the K cross sigma or not K dot sigma like I had before, but it's actually uh, very similar. It's just a transformation on the Pauli matrices and the coupling to a magnetization that now is a vector um, that changes direction in space. And what um, uh, was found by Hurst and Dimitri and uh, others is that basically this kind of magnetization traps uh, a fermionic um, state. So all of the fermionic states, the bulk states are gapped, but within that gap, you would have one localized state or more localized states um, that are tied to the skirmion. And you see that uh, most of the probability is around the skirmion and peaks uh, at the perimeter of the, the skirmion. Um, if you look at the spectrum, uh, in gray are bulk states, and in blue are these skirmion bound states, and you can have multiple ones. If the total, magnetic, the total field is zero, then it's symmetric around zero energy. Otherwise, it doesn't have to be symmetric. Uh, our question was the following. So we know already what happens when you have one skirmion and you add these fermionic Dirac excitations. What happens to the interaction between skirmions? So in general, if I take two skirmions and I only have the magnetic system, they repel each other. So if I try to minimize the free energy, uh, the free energy is minimized for a separation, a very large separation between the skirmions. Why? Because there's some frustration here with the spins. They don't like to be close to each other because it's hard to decide whether the spin should be pointing in minus y or plus y. Um, so that's why more or less at large distances, it's just um, exponentially decaying, but uh, stronger, uh, stronger repulsion as you go closer 
uh, uh, between the two skirmions. However, you should ask what happens when I also have these uh, skirmion bound states. And I can just think of that as a level and, and just a double well potential kind of thing. I have um, a distance X and therefore I would have some tunneling between, um, sorry, between these two states or there's some overlap between these two states. If I try to put one electron into the system, I would not go into one skirmion or the other. I would go into bonding and anti-bonding states of these two uh, states. And that is also uh, decaying exponentially with length, but is attractive. So in this case, we actually have both attraction and repulsion between the skirmions. So the question is, can we create a molecular state? And the answer is yes. Uh, I'm gonna skip a little bit. I'm just gonna say that we're actually thinking only of a single electron uh, possibility. And of course, if the temperature is low, a single electron would like to go to the bonding state, not the antibonding. And we calculate the total energy of the system, uh, taking into account the chemical potential. So the chemical potential is uh, ab above the bonding dispersion, then the total attraction is the bonding. If it's below, then it's cut at some point because you just cannot add another uh, more energy. Um, and that gives us, if we put the two energies together, the magnetic energy and the binding energy, this gives us um, a different profile. So depending on where the chemical potential is, we either have a minimum, that would be a stable molecular state of two skirmions. We might have a minimum, but such that if you come from infinity, there's a barrier to get to that minimum. So if you start with very far skirmions and try to connect them, you might not have enough energy or temperature to go over that barrier, but still the true ground state is a molecular state. Or you might have a metastable state that the true ground state is actually infinite separation, but you do have some optimum uh, separation, which is a metastable uh, that you can tunnel out with time. And there could be no uh, molecular state at all. And if we put this all uh, on a phase diagram, we can control that uh, with both this parameter mu, which is the chemical potential, basically saying it's which energy does the, the electron want to come in? And uh, this parameter xi, which is the length scale of the skirmion. So uh, maybe before I go on to skirmion solid, I can pa pause here if there are more questions. You don't hear me. We have a question from uh, uh, Nagi. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, that was pretty good, the slide with skirmions with the uh, interaction potentials. Uh, it's actually kind of like the Leonard Jones potential for fundamental atomics, right? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I just wanted to know, can you do a, a Kittel equivalent treatment and give us some kind of uh, period calculation for skirmions? And if we, uh, we are experimentalists, we want to design things based on uh, some computations. And mm -hmm. uh, can you organize, and, and how can we organize these skirmions in an hexagonal lattice? Oh, okay, so, so next I go to lattice. Here I'm just talking about um, uh, two skirmions, which might be harder to isolate. But one thing that you can uh, say here is, in the state before you have enough skirmions to form a lattice, um, you can see if they're bunching or not. Basically, if two skirmions are attracted to each other or not. So I don't know what you would measure except for imaging them, um, uh, you know, spatially. Uh, I'm not sure how to to quantify this, but if you can gate the system and basically see that the skirmions move either towards each other or go away from each other, that would be a signature of this molecular state. Okay. Yeah, there's some work done on ferroelectrics with just two vortices and how the periodicity between two vortices changes. But uh, 
this uh, is periodicity yes. of what? Sorry. Vortices. So, so instead of skirmions, these are just vortices in ferroelectric. Uh, yeah, but history. it's periodic in, in what? Uh, sorry, not periodicity, spacing. Ah, spacing. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Yeah. yeah, so this is very similar. Um, right. I, I know it's not easy to, to isolate skirmions, but if one can take snapshots and, and change the gate, maybe one uh, can see that. Thank you. I also have a question. So in plane magnetization can be uh, seen as some uh, emergent magnetic field. You mean due to the skirmion itself? Yes, but when you have interference between two skirmions, what uh, happens between them? In, can it be seen as some kind of special profile of magnetic field between them? Um, so so you, you mean not to, to measure the total magnetic field, but to, I, to I, kind I, of... Uh, I mean that skirmion has out of plane magnetization can, that can be seen as Dirac mass. Yeah. And yeah. in plane magnetization, that can be presented as some kind of vector potential, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and its profile could be could re, some special profile could result in magnetic effective magnetic field. And when yes. two, two skirmions they interfere, it might result to some interference pattern for the magnetic field. Yes. Okay. So that that's very interesting. We, it's a, it's a nice thought. We, we didn't really think of very close by skirmions. Okay. Um, you know, I mean, also the, the forces between the skirmions and all of that, they're not exactly exponential when you go to, uh, to very uh, short distances. So this is at uh, kind of higher distances when you can approximate things as exponential. But okay. it's an okay. interesting thought, you know, what happens and and I know skirmions, you know, just you know, without uh, without the Dirac electrons, they don't like to wind twice. The lowest energy configurations, you would have two um, two uh, one uh, number one skirmions rather than one skirmion with winding two. Um, but that might change once you add the fermions. But we haven't we haven't looked at that at all. Uh, I think it would take more of a you know, real simulation. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so so let me go on to the last uh, uh, topic and I'll do that quickly. Should I leave more time uh, for questions in the end? I guess five, five minutes is fine. We, we, we would be happy to continue if this needed. Okay, great. So, so now I'm really looking at a skirmion solid. Um, People saw skirmion solids in some materials not on the surface of a magnetic topological insulator, but one can still dream that we can take a skirmion solid and put it in proximity uh, to, um, to Dirac uh, fermions and ask what will happen. So um, we try to answer that in two simple ways. One is, what if I just think of an overlap I have one skirmion bound state, another skirmion bound state. I can just write a tight binding model. And this will not be interested if, interesting if I had only one skirmion bound state, but usually they come in pairs. Um, and, and then I would have different tunneling properties depending on, um, uh, on the symmetries here. And it turns out that in a very simple, um, simple model, if I only have two states per skirmion and I let them overlap, um, I can get uh, bands. I can get a band structure for my uh, super lattice. So you should think of these skirmion bound states like uh, atomic orbitals. And now they overlap with each other and hop and they give you bands. And it turns out that the bands could be trivial. This is here in the middle of the phase diagram or they could be topological. And for different uh, bands, I, I've written here the churn number. There are only two bands. So at most we got minus two and two, but most of the phase diagram is minus one and one. So this is one approach. I can do it for, of course, more states, but uh, this is very clean and very easy to do. 
we did something else where we thought of uh, this background as being a weak perturbation. So now I'm really solving this Hamiltonian where I have um, the fermionic part and this is a small perturbation. So I'm doing perturbation in this delta in the way that um, I basically take a periodic uh, modulation and I add harmonics. And at some point I, I cut it. And I just ask numerically, what would be now uh, the spectrum? And it turns out that of course, um, there are many gapped states at high uh, energy, which are higher and lower than the mass uh, everywhere, but if I look at low energy, I see these bands and they change with the skirmion par parameter. It turns out that they sometimes are topological. So now if I look at these bands and what I'm changing here are is the skirmion radius, I can have these bands with churn number zero. So these are trivial bands. So, you know, right here is a lot of bulk states. Here is something that probably came from the, the skirmion bound states. And, um, and they give me bands, but these bands are non-topological. However, I can play with the skirmion radius until at some point the gap between these two bands is closed. And when I uh, continue to change R and the gap opens on the other side, I now get actually topological bands. So that's uh, more or less the message. Uh, so that should remind you of the phase diagram I showed before, but now we have a, a phase diagram for this uh, technique, which also sh uh, shows us uh, the same phase transition. Here we're just writing uh, the lowest four energy bands, uh, but we can go between uh, non-topological and topological. Um, we can also make uh, some connections between these two approaches by taking the band states and building the Venia functions. And um, maybe not surprisingly, but uh, I was kind of happy to see this, that when we do these Venia states, they look like rings. So very similar to the single skirmion states that uh, we discussed before. And then for these uh, Venia states, we can actually calculate the different overlaps, so the type binding parameters, and, and see how the models actually uh, can complement each other. So let me finish here. Um, I'll just summarize in the spirit of uh, Zoom talks. Uh, when you have a 3D topological insulator, the bulk is gapped. On the surface, you would have a Dirac cone. If you add magnetic moments on the surface, you would gap the cone. If you have some spin texture, which has a domain wall, you would get domain wall bound states. They could be also skirmion like, and you would have a skirmion bound state. These skirmions usually repel each other, but they could also overlap and have some hopping of an electron from one skirmion bound state to the other and give you attraction in a molecular uh, skirmionic state. And if you have a lattice, uh, all of these states overlap and give you bands. And these bands can sometimes be topological bands. So with that, I'm gonna uh, end and I'm happy to answer any questions. And thank you for being uh, with me today. Thank you for a great talk. I think we have a couple of questions. Uh, I see Dimi. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so yeah, I, very nice talk. Um, so I, I, I have one question that came to my mind uh, now that might be more later on. But um, of course, uh, you know, these topological insulators, as you know, they're uh, being studied a lot by people who are looking at spin orbit torques, right? And you put them on ferromagnets and so on. And um, so I was thinking, you know, if you drive this system electrically, Right, and you get an interaction between the maybe the spin polarization. You have a skirmion, right, on top. Let's say, and you drive this electrically, then then you have you generate a spin polarization topological insulator, and this presumably would affect the skirmion in some way. And then then the skirmion might have a back action on the 
on the topological structure as well. Maybe you could end up with a feedback effect. Or so, have yes. you have you ever considered this 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 kind of physics? Yeah. So so you know, uh, Bill and I, Bill Koish and I are thinking about that for I think three years now, and we we kind of are taking baby steps. But you know, the in the end, you might want to close the loop. You want to see how the, the magnetization is affecting your electrons and then how your electrons are affecting the magnetization again. And yeah. if you're adding the field, this gives you another control, which could be very interesting because maybe you can move skirmions around. Right. And one, one, one reason I'm also very interested in that is that there's some uh, recent proposals that people say, if you have this skirmion, and you put it next to um, a superconductor, oh. you might actually create a Majorana state. Um, and, okay. uh, and you, you create kind of a, a localized Majorana, you don't actually need it to be a topological superconductor. And uh, because instead of the spin orbit coupling, the skirmion gives you that uh, texture that you want. Right. And then with your idea of, of adding fields, I might be able to my, move this Majorana around. So. And, and braid it. <laughs> and, and yeah, of course, and braid it. So you can, you can build your quantum computer uh, this way. Yes. Right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think this is extremely interesting. And, and we, uh, I think we, we kind of, uh, and molested some uh, PhD students uh, on the way, uh, but we're we're continuing to to t torture, uh, and now a new student. <laughs> well, I'm glad the spirit is is still strong. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So we can, we can. I'm sure we can talk offline because Reza and uh, myself we've been looking at some similar nothing to do with Majoranas or skirmions, but some similar ideas and. Yeah, maybe we can we can discuss this further. Uh, yeah, sure, sure. Let's set up something that could be interesting. And you know, you have uh, lots of experience in, in these uh, torque systems, so uh, I'd be happy to learn uh, from this. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, so okay, we have another question from Oliver. Please ask. Uh, hi, sorry. Yeah, I was just wondering if um, there was any physical significance for the ratios that you found that produced the topological bands uh, just at the end. Yeah, um, so we don't know exactly. Um, I don't have a lot of intuition, and that's why I like to have this two band model, because this two band model, I went through that pretty quickly. Let's see. Um, uh, yeah, the two band model basically assumes uh, that you have overlap. But if I have two skirmion bound states, I could have overlap between, uh, and, and these skirmion bound states, usually they're, they're angular momentum eigenstates if you have a single skirmion. Uh, so you can think of them as like plus or minus um, half um, uh, angular momentum. And, and that gives me a two level system on each skirmion and now they start to overlap. So the significance of when you get or, or how you change your position in this phase diagram is whether this tau tilde, which is a hopping between different flavor skirmion uh, bound state or tau, which is hopping between same skirmion bound state uh, is important here. So, and as you can see, you know, there, there are different places and it's a very simple model. Once you write it in, in two, uh, just this two level system, it's just a two, two by two matrix in momentum space. And you can see exactly what happened, but definitely it's not enough to have, you know, if you, if you have no hopping between different flavors of skirmions, you're just on this boring one line, which is actually all trivial. So you need some overlap between skirmions of different flavors. And then you get uh, to this, these other phases. Um, that's all the intuition I have. We kind of see it also in, uh, in the other simulation when we change the radius of, um, of skirmions. When we change mm -hmm. the radius, we actually see how we need more overlap between them. And also it seems like the more abrupt change in magnetization, 
uh, the better it is for topology. Okay, thank you so much. Cheers. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I also have a question. So these states are chiral in a sense that they circulate only in one direction. How does it manifest in the tie binding model? Oh yeah, so that's a, that's a good question. I didn't, um, I didn't dwell on that, but basically if you take into account the, the angular dependence and the spin dependence of that um, bound state, it affects the overlap integral. Of course, you know, if you just have overlap between two skirmions, you can gauge things away. It's just one scalar. But if you calculated that, you chose a gauge. Now you go to another neighbor, which is 30 or 60 degrees away, that bears some, uh, uh, some symmetry properties because you, you chose uh, the bound state. It's kind of like you chose an angle to your, um, to your bound state. So if I calculated the overlap, oh, sorry, I'm trying to, to annotate on something. If you calculated this overlap, and now you calculate this overlap, um, you would have a factor that would actually depend on, uh, let's say, j minus j prime, when one is maybe one, the other is minus one, and the angle, the direction of your overlap. So it is not a very a, a simple uh, lattice with just electrons hopping on the lattice. These are special bound states that hop on the lattice and they have angular momentum, which uh, is manifested in this kind of overlap. Okay, I see quite tricky. Uh, do we have any other questions? If you have just, please go and ask them. Let's wait for a couple of seconds. Okay, if no, uh, thank you for great talk, Tammy. Thank and you. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, yeah, I really enjoyed actually everybody's <laughs> questions. This is uh, very nice uh, after being alone in a, in a room for so long. <laughs> yeah. Thank you everybody for coming in the Zoom.